Flying 253 miles over Western Africa, a great view from the Soyuz of the International Space Station and the docking port on the Rossviet module. A final approach is expected just moments from now. Docking scheduled at 2.43 a.m. Central Time. Imagine, you're sitting inside a tiny capsule on top of a missile in a seat half the size of one you'd find on an airline economy class. This arbitrary moment is what astronauts and cosmonauts have trained years for. The moment they realize their hard work is about to pay off. That moment was just a small part of what was my greatest adventure yet. Today we're going to the other side of the world. Along the way we're going to answer some questions. What does it take to become an astronaut? How do you cook and eat food in space? And why does my butt look so big in this spacesuit? I'm Lee Gia, and welcome to the STEM. Let's figure it out. When working together, human beings could do some pretty incredible things, like, I don't know, maybe land a man on the moon or 12, or build a space station using different modules from around the world like a $100 billion international game of Legos. Even today, we're bringing rockets back to recycle and reuse them, like we do with airplanes. And private space agencies are even working on making space accessible for public tourism, fingers crossed, within our lifetimes. Just imagine all of us having access to outer space. It's a dream, but every great adventure begins with a little uncertainty. It's not easy. In fact, astronauts spend two years going through just their basic training. So is this something that basically everybody can do? What are astronauts even training for? To find out, I'm meeting with someone 6,000 miles from where I'm standing. Together, we're going to go through some of that basic training and see if we have what it takes to go to space. <laughs> and welcome to Moscow. Joining me today is the legendary science communicator, Emily Calandrelli. Привет! And uh, Emily, what's the plan for tomorrow? We, tomorrow we are doing some introductory training to become cosmonauts. We are going to eat cosmonaut food, we're going to go in a human centrifuge, we're going to try on a spacesuit, and we're going to get some flight training on a Soyuz spacecraft. About 20 miles in that direction is Star City, Russia, home of the Yuri Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center. But you might be wondering, who is Yuri Gagarin, and why did they name this training center after him? Hundreds and hundreds of people have already been to space. Neil Armstrong, Mae Jemison, Mikhail Kornienko, Peggy Whitson. But the first one was Yuri Gagarin. In January of 1960, the Cosmonaut Training Center was built in Star City, but it wasn't named after Gagarin just yet. The Soviet space program had to figure out who'd fit the bill as the first human in space. 3,461. That's how many fighter pilots were examined to become the first person to leave the Earth. And believe it or not, only 347 of them were selected for an interview. Then 206 of those pilots went through a medical exam, which only 95 of them passed. Even after more medical checks, that number narrowed down to just 20 pilots. These 20 were selected and enlisted as the world's first cosmonaut students. Oh, and if you thought it was that easy, all of that, that's just getting accepted. Still, none of these people know how to fly a spaceship. Training has really only just begun. The cosmonauts had to endure extreme situations under G-forces, heat, and stress. But while they all performed well, one man handled the intensity as calm as can be. The man who dreamt of going to space since he was a kid. His name is Yuri Alexeyevich Gagarin. Nearly 60 years later, we're here in Star City where Yuri Gagarin trained, and now, so are we. Our training consisted of five parts. The first thing we'd do is take our astronaut medical exam, then we'd get G-force training in the human centrifuge, from there we'd learn how to cook and eat food in space, and then finally, we'd get our spacesuits fitted and learn how to fly our Soyuz spacecraft. Once 
Once we got to the training center, we immediately jumped right into the medical exam. This was to make sure we wouldn't pass out in the human centrifuge. Both physical and mental health are huge priorities in selecting space people. Even the slightest anomaly could get you kicked out of the cosmonaut selection process. Thanks. You made a mistake. Okay, cancel. You're not a cosmonaut anymore. <laughs> no pressure or anything. Emily was up first. And boom, she passed with flying colors. Easy. I was up next. I sat down with the doctor. And to my surprise... Okay, so... I was just a little bit excited. And jet-lagged running on three cups of coffee. So I waited. After a few minutes, they measured my blood pressure again. Failed. And again. Failed that too. My heart was beating faster and faster, knowing I might go home without passing this exam. I failed the Cosmonaut Medical three times. I came to Star City only to get rejected after only about 30 minutes. The doctor said they would let me take the exam once more but I needed more time to slow my heart rate. I wanted to see Emily take a ride in the human centrifuge. This was the first true test of whether we had the right stuff for outer space. The centrifuge Emily's about to ride in consists of a capsule, attached to a giant arm, attached to a pivot point. The capsule is at the very edge of the arm, therefore it spins the most. As the capsule spins around the pivot point faster and faster, the sheer centripetal forces push Emily's body back against the seat. This increases something called the G-force exerted on Emily. That's one G, Emily. Oh my gosh, I'm just like imagining I'm in a rocket. A Soyuz rocket has three stages. Those stages separate when they run out of fuel. The centrifuge crew explained to us that astronauts and cosmonauts experience nearly four Gs for two and a half minutes. Then, the first stage separates from the rest of the rocket. The crew experiences a drop from 4Gs to 1G. And then, as the second stage ignites, back up to 4Gs. Then again, second stage separation. The third stage is the final stage to ignite. This one carries the crew to low Earth orbit, home to the International Space Station. This is where they'll finally experience weightlessness. The ride from the ground to low Earth orbit takes roughly 10 minutes, which is how long Emily spent in the centrifuge. I had to experience it for myself, but I still had a medical exam to pass. So before they check my blood pressure again, let me show you my brain. This is Piper. She's going to represent my brain. Here she is before Emily went on the centrifuge. And here's my brain after Emily's ride. You see, this Piper's thinking about all the things that could go wrong. What if she doesn't get to ride the centrifuge today? What if she fails the cosmonaut medical a fourth time? What if Piper doesn't have what it takes to go to space? But my brain here, on the other hand, just witnessed Emily go through the experience of a lifetime. She's thinking about how amazing it would be to ride on the centrifuge and have a taste of what it's really like to launch on a Soyuz rocket into space. Now, a rocket launch is no joke. At this point, I realized why cosmonauts and astronauts are selected over others because they're able to focus on one thing, and one thing only. The mission. My mission now is to pass that medical exam. I am so excited. thing I think I've ever done in my life. That yeah. was awesome. And I'm really glad I did it. I'm really glad like everything worked out and that wow. This was this was magical. This was quite an experience. Yeah. So so cool.
So now that Emily and I are ready to take on the trip to low Earth orbit, we're starting to get a little hungry. You guessed it, it's time for a Cosmonaut Kitchen! Now when I say space food, astronaut ice cream is probably what comes to mind. You know, those small freeze-dried cubes you can get at science museums or space centers. But here's the deal. Astronaut ice cream was never, and will never be, eaten in space. Let's find out why. Both Emily and I ordered a three-course meal. Emily got borscht, beef with rice, served with an apple cranberry sauce, coffee, and sugar biscuits. I ordered the pea puree soup, eggplant and potato stew, apple juice, coffee, and a honey cake. As a vegetarian, I was surprised they had as many options as they did. We're going to learn how to prepare and eat these items in microgravity. Astronauts currently do this on the International Space Station for pretty much all of their meals. We started by heating up Emily's borscht, a traditional Russian beet soup. Whoa. That's awesome. What blew my mind wasn't the hydrating process, but these special bags. Yes, they're used for hydrating the soups, but they're specifically designed so that you can flip it for eating. All we had to do was apply pressure to the seam where we added the hot water, and then... <laughs> oh, oh. It's magic! None of the soup spills out. Most space food has to be rehydrated. The water has to be added back into the food. But why do they have to be dehydrated in the first place? So I'm here at the Florida State College at Jacksonville, and I'm here with Chef Joe Harold, who's gonna tell us exactly why we can't send normal food into space. So, Joe, why is that the case? Because of the high percentage of water. Uh, summer squash has 94% water, asparagus has 93%, and of all things, watermelon has 93% some water. Wow, so sending that much water, most of food is water, and with that said, it's probably very heavy, very expensive to send into space. Exactly. We realized that space food must be three things. Easy to prepare, easy to eat, and easy to clean. This is why astronaut ice cream is a lie. When you eat astronaut ice cream, the loose crumbs and particles would fly around in space, making it not only a mess, but a hazard to the equipment and the air supply on the International Space Station. Anyway, it's time for dessert. I had the honey cake with coffee, and Emily had her tea biscuits with coffee. What do you think? So, it kind of tastes like gluten-free bread, where it's really um, dense, mm -hmm. because you know, the bread is not really common in space because the crumbs get everywhere. Right. But the, the flavor is really good. Anything that crumbled is no good yes. in space, because there's electronics everywhere. Yep. And those little particles can get inside electronics, and imagine getting crumbs all over your computer, yeah. like nobody wants that. Even just breathing it in. Even, you know? Yeah, exactly. Because the air is, is uh, you know, there's a, it's a pretty confined space. Mm -hmm. So anything in the air is just something that they can prevent. Now that we've eaten, it's time to get our spacesuits fitted. We're putting on the Sokol spacesuit, which is Russian for Falcon. The Falcon suit was first used in 1973 on Soyuz 12. It was created after the tragedy of Soyuz 11, which killed three cosmonauts during re-entry after the cabin depressurized. The Soviet space program began to improve the safety and reliability of human space travel. And so far, it's worked for nearly 50 years. The Falcon suit is still used today by astronauts going to and from the ISS. This is a type of intravehicular activity, or IVA suit. These are designed for emergency situations, like if a spacecraft malfunctions, or debris hits the space station, or if a cabin depressurizes like on Soyuz 11. We had her put our undergarment on, slip on the spacesuit, seal the inner rubber insulation, zip and clip the outer layer, click the gloves on, connect the oxygen supply, and pressurize the suit, all in under five minutes. I'm wearing a spacesuit, everybody. This is the time frame astronauts train for in case of an emergency. Those tanks connected to us give us about two hours of emergency oxygen. The other types of spacesuits are called extravehicular activity, or EVA suits. These protect astronauts from extreme heat and cold and hold over eight hours of life support. These suits are used on spacewalks, and they're designed to combat the harsh environment of space for a long time, unlike the IVAs. One thing the IVA and EVA suits have in common is that they both require podgozniks. Yes, astronauts wear diapers. 
No wonder our butts look so big. This is it. The moment. I'm sitting in the commander seat of the Soyuz spacecraft trainer. The same seat where commanders of the International Space Station have spent months training in. Now you might be asking, what could you possibly be training such a long time for? There's a lot to think about, especially during a rocket launch. We practiced a few emergency procedures that we might run into during launch and in transit to and from the space station. Once we were in orbit, we'd spend a few hours traveling to the station, where we'd use the manual controls to dock in case the automatic systems failed. And just like that, we did it. Emily and I experienced just a fraction of what the nearly 600 astronauts and cosmonauts had to go through before heading up there. All right, so Emily, what'd you think of today? Today was amazing. It was quite literally one of the best days of my life. I know, we're both super, super exhausted. I know, we did a it was so packed. Lot. Yes. Yeah. Um, but what do you? What was your favorite experience? What, what oh was the best gosh. thing we did today? Um, I think the centrifuge, just because that was such, there was so much buildup and I was a little bit nervous and they had all those sensors on us, checking our vitals and it felt yeah. just like the most intense experience. Yeah. that we had today, so I like that one the most, I think. Yeah, I really enjoyed putting on the spacesuit. Yeah, um, yeah, you it, definitely love that one. I know, just finally feeling like you're one step closer to mm -hmm. your dream, that was just, I don't know. Yeah, that just, felt real. Yeah, it was very, very real, and the real Soyuz. Yeah, it was like the, the real um, Soyuz simulator that cosmonauts mm -hmm. use, and so we exactly. like sat in the same seats that our fate, like our most favorite astronauts and cosmonauts sat in. So yep. yeah, that was pretty cool. Awesome. Emily, yeah. thank you so much for joining yeah, me. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, for one of the most memorable experiences of my entire life. I definitely learned a lot and fingers crossed, we'll get to use that knowledge in space for real sometime soon. Be sure to like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel and tune in to Spinnaker Television for future episodes. Let us know in the comments if you think you have what it takes to go to space. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on The STEM.